and a single democracy, a real democracy in Palestine, where both where Palestinians are free, will be better for Israelis too. Well, don't you worry, ScarJo. Apartheid is sexy. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 22 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. We begin with the assassination of a 14-year-old Palestinian boy, Yusuf Ashawamra. He was killed for going through a gap in a fence trying to pick wild food plants. Then we continue with the end of the speech by Miko Peled at the Tree of Life Conference in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Peled is the son of a late Israeli general, but a powerful critic of Israeli apartheid. After that, a video from Jewish Voice for Peace with a Passover message from a number of rabbis who participate in BDS. Let's divest from Hewlett Packard. Finally, an on-the-nose satire from Apartheid Adventures. We begin with the killing of a young man on the West Bank. Yusuf Ashawamra was murdered at the end of March. I'm going to read to you from an article written not by a human rights activist, but by the editorial board of the very mainstream Israeli paper, Haaretz. It's entitled, Nothing Short of a War Crime. Yusuf Ashawamra and two of his friends left their village of Deir al-Assal Afakwa in the southern West Bank to pick plants on his family's field, west of the separation fence. The three youths passed through a wide gap in the fence, which had existed for at least two years and which the Israel Defense Forces hadn't bothered to fix. After crossing the fence, the boys heard three or four gunshots. This chain of events is extremely grave. Opening fire automatically on people who pass through a gap in the fence is abhorrent and despicable. Ah, Shawamra is the victim of a war crime. There was no other way to describe the circumstances of his death. This is part two of the talk that Miko Pellet gave at the Tree of Life conference last year. Pellet is an Israeli citizen and author of the book, The General's Son. As we left off last week, he was speaking about the Oslo peace process. However, it fell apart because the reality was that by 1993, the West Bank was fully integrated into Israel and there was no chance that there could ever be a Palestinian state established. The purpose of Oslo was not a peace accord. The purpose of Oslo was to bring the Palestinians to surrender and the Israelis were hoping that Arafat would agree. And he didn't, so it fell apart. So it had, they had five years to reach a, a final solution. Five years went by, nothing happened. 1993, that was 1998. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton, before he left office, decided to bring everybody into Camp David and try to close the deal. Two weeks went by and nothing happened. Bill Clinton came up and he said, well, the Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. Blaming the Palestinians for not willing to make concessions. Yasser Arafat, by agreeing to this idea of a two-state solution, had given up 80% of his homeland representing the Palestinians, of course, and given up the rights for these Palestinians to ever return, the refugees to ever return, and agreed to recognize the state that created this, that destroyed Palestine, and make peace with that very state, all for a Palestinian state within the West Bank and Gaza, with East Jerusalem as its capital, and that was not enough. That was not enough for concession. He had to go down on his knees and accept the Israeli narrative and accept Israeli dominance over the water, over the land, and over Palestinian lives forever. And that he would not do. And for that he was vilified, and four years later he died in Ramallah with Israeli tanks surrounding his office. For 30 years, Yasser Arafat was the most consistent voice for peace in the Middle East, between the mid-1970s and the day he died in 2004. 
that he was vilified because he would not surrender. Israel, on the other hand, has shown no sign, not a single sign that it was interested or willing to make peace with the Palestinians. If we look at Palestinians, what we heard today about the water, is that not ethnic cleansing? Why in the world would anybody expect that Palestinians could live with such a small proportion of water compared to what Israelis live with and compared with what the World, the world Health Organization demands? It's only to get them to leave, to get them to die or leave, as, as, as horrific as this sounds. And this only doesn't only happen in the West Bank. It happens in the Negev Desert. Entire Palestinian communities living, and this is inside Israel. These are Israeli citizens, right next to Israeli, uh, Israeli towns. Yet somehow, when it's an Israeli town, the water seems to reach the city. And the electricity has no problem. But when it's a Palestinian town, it's somehow the water doesn't make it, as it gets tired along the way. When it's a Palestinian town, the roads are not being um, paved, and the electricity just doesn't make it. And this is even within Israel. So whether it's the Negev, or the Galilee, or Yaffa, or, or, or in Jerusalem itself, which is a whole other entity for Palestinians, or anywhere in the West Bank. There is no attempt, there is no desire to compromise on the issue of the land, because it's the land of Israel, it belongs to the Jews, and Palestinians will have to either accept it or leave. And they won't. They won't accept it, and they won't leave. And this, and this, and this, is, and this is a big problem for Israel. I think one of, the, one of the expressions of the fact that Palestinians won't give up and won't leave has to do, is, is, is reflected in the fact that Israel has thousands and thousands of Palestinian prisoners. Thousands of, po of political prisoners. Israel calls them terrorists. But the fact remains, the fact is that the vast majority of these prisoners, the vast majority of these prisoners have not been charged with acts of violence. The vast majority of the thousands of prisoners in Israeli jails have not been charged with acts of violence. They are not terrorists. Only a small portion have been charged. And on top of that, you have hundreds of prisoners that have been charged with nothing at all. And this is even with the low bar of the Israeli judicial system and the way the Israeli judicial system treats Palestinians. They found nothing with which to charge these people and they arrested them anyway, sometimes for years, under administrative, uh, administrative detention. This is a democracy? They say that Palestinians are one of the most incarcerated people in the world because of this. You can hardly find a Palestinian family in the West Bank and Gaza who doesn't have a loved one or had a loved one in prison. And of course, they carry it as a badge of honor. Not to mention the fact that the uh, international law and the United Nations recognizes the rights of people to resist. I remember my father once was uh, being interviewed, and of course, you know, a retired Israeli general, and he was asked, how do you talk to terrorists? How is it okay to talk to terrorists? And he said, well, terrorism is a terrible thing. At the same time, when a small nation is, uh, is occupied by a larger power, quite often, Terrorism is the only means at their disposal. Like we heard earlier, sometimes they come to a point where there is no other choice. If we don't like the terrorism, if we don't like the, 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 the resistance, the oppressor has a choice. The resistance is a response to the oppression. It's a response to the occupation of Palestine. And if we want to read what the United, what the United Nations resolution says, it's on, it's on the screen, that the struggles of people under colonial and alien and racist regimes three things that characterize the state of Israel precisely for the implementation of their rights to self-determination and independence is legitimate and in full accordance with the principles of international law. The world recognizes the right of people to resist. If Israel doesn't like the rockets coming out of Gaza, they know what to do. You lift the siege of Gaza and you let people go free. The option is there. The option is there. And once again, it goes in the face of this notion that somehow Israel is a democracy. And once again, it doesn't matter necessarily if they are in the West Bank, if they are in other parts of Palestine. The entire occupation of Palestine is, should, should be deemed illegal, and all the Israeli cities on it are illegal. There is no difference between the cities in the West Bank and cities outside the West Bank. They're all built exactly the same way. Destruction of Palestinian towns, expulsion of Palestinians, and exclusion of Palestinians from what was built for Israelis only and then letting Palestinians figure it out with no rights and no access. I know many of you have met my sister when she was here and her husband Rami. This is their daughter Smadar that was killed. Um, 
And the story, of, the story of the victims is a terrible story because more often than not, the victims are innocent civilians and children. In our family, it was my sister's uh, daughter, Smadar, that was killed. She was 13 years old. She was going downtown Jerusalem. It was September the 4th, 1997. School had just started. She was going shopping with some friends. Two young Palestinians blew themselves up, take, took their own lives, took the life of Smadar and several other Israelis. I was living here in the US at the time. I took the first plane home. And really, this is not something you can even begin to understand or you begin, you don't know what to think, you don't know what to say or do. But I knew I had to be there, so I took the first plane home. And by the time I reached my sister's apartment in Jerusalem, it was packed with reporters. It's always big news when there's an attack in Israel, but this was bigger news because here is the, the victim, or one of the victims, was the granddaughter of a well-known general and a well-known general who dedicated his life to Palestinian rights, to be an advocate for Palestinian rights. So this was even bigger news. And of course, people always want to know what about revenge and what about retaliation and how do we get them and how many do we kill and so on. And so they presented these questions to my sister Nurit. And after the funeral, when she came out to talk to people, she addressed these issues and she said, well, first of all, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. The notion of killing people in response to somebody's death, particularly a child. What real mother would want to see this horror happen to another mother? And she quoted a, a, a line from, from Bialik, a well-known Hebrew poet, who wrote that the devil himself could not come up with vengeance that's appropriate for the death of a child. And in terms of who is responsible, she said, quite clearly, quite clearly, when we take away people's land and destroy their homes, we take their water, we incarcerate their fathers for indefinite amounts of time, we shoot their brothers and sisters in their schoolyard when they're defenseless, we drop bombs on them. What do we expect? What do we expect? And both she and Rami, her husband, said and continue to say, that they hold the Israeli government directly responsible for their daughter's death. So now this, this became even bigger news because we have this Israeli bereaved mother who's turning the story upside down. Because we know that the Palestinians are terrorists, the Israelis are victims. We know that Israelis want peace, Palestinians, you can't talk to them. And suddenly she's turning everything upside down. Well, Nurit became uh, very outspoken about Palestinian rights, as did Rami, her husband, and their three boys. I came back to the US. And you have to start wondering, what, how do you pick up and go? I mean, when you see the small coffin of a child going into the ground, let me tell you, it's not something you can just brush off. And my good fortune was that in San Diego, I met a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group, and I decided to attend meetings. And for the first time in my life, I met Palestinians. Now, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, which, as all of you know, is a mixed city. But I don't know if you know this, it's a completely segregated city. It's a completely racist city, so Israelis never meet Palestinians even though geographically we're very close. So the first time in the book, in fact, the chapter in the book that talks about my journey or the beginning of my journey starts with the lines, my journey into Palestine began in San Diego. I was 39 years old. And not only was it the first time I met Palestinians, but it was the first time I was with Palestinians in the same place and we were equal. No checkpoints, no curfews, no permits were needed. And the laws that applied to my life and the laws that applied to their life were the same laws. That does not exist anywhere. Not in Tel Aviv, not in Haifa, not in Akka, not in the Negev, not in the West Bank, certainly not in Gaza. There are no laws that protect Palestinians. So this was a very powerful experience, a very positive one for me. Many Israelis would come to these meetings and leave because they couldn't stand it. Looking eye to eye at eye level with Palestinians, they would leave and say, they would call me and they would say, how do you sit with these extremists? I said, what extremists? I mean, we're all here to try to figure this out. Everybody's coming with their story. And very graciously and very generously, they took me by the hand, this Palestinian community in San Diego, and led me through this very painful process, very physically painful process of, first of all, realizing that there's another story and it's valid. And then realizing that when you have two stories that are opposite, only one can be true, and in this case, it wasn't mine. My story was not true. And that is, I have to tell you, physically painful. It's like having a tooth extracted with no anesthesia. Now, in the end, we have to resolve this issue. We have to resolve this issue. 
The reality today is that there is a binational single state over all of Palestine with exclusive rights for Jewish people. That's what it is. It's a single state over the entire country. The assumption that there could be one day an Israeli government that will allow the Palestinians to establish their own state is absurd. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad. It's an absolute impossibility. Zionism, it opposed everything that Zionism and the State of Israel stand for. And when we support the State of the, the Israel, the Jewish State, as America does, as, an, as, as, a country, as, a, as a country, as a government, and many, and many countries in the West do, people have to realize that it's a package deal. They're supporting a state that comes with political prisoners, comes with torture, comes with denying people water, comes with forcing people off their land, it comes with home demolitions. It comes with bombing children in Gaza on a regular basis. Regardless of it's Hamas or not Hamas, attacks on Gaza have been going on for 60 years. On a regular basis. This is a package deal. This is the only way you can have a Jewish state in an Arab country where half the population is not Jewish. But there is another option. Two out of three, right? One more to go. I would say it's more than two out of three because it, only in my lifetime, I'm, I'm 51, I remember when Greece and, and, and Spain were fascist dictatorships. Many of us remember that all of Latin America was, were, were military dictatorships. And of course, South Africa. And in every single one of these, there was somebody who said, it's impossible, it will never happen. They're too strong. It will never happen. It's impossible. And it happened. And in most cases, it happened with, with very little or no bloodshed. Thanks to the great people who, 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 who made it happen. There is no reason to assume that a pluralistic, secular democracy that includes Israelis and Palestinians cannot thrive in Palestine. There is no reason to assume this. There is no reason to assume that just like apartheid in South Africa, Zionism will fall in Palestine. Now, of course, in this case, people say, oh, you're talking like Ahmadinejad. You want to destroy Jews. You want another Holocaust. You're being anti-Semitic. Well, they can say that all they want. Nobody's talking about violence. And a single democracy, a real democracy in Palestine, where both where Palestinians are free, will be better for Israelis too. To live as an occupying society is like a cancer. It, it, it eats the society up from within. Even when you drive on the Israeli side of the wall, you still see the wall. It's all pretty and everything and decorated, but it's still a wall. When you're in the military and you see the soldiers or your son or your brothers in the military walking around with these guns and fully armed all the time and preparing for God knows what, that means there's something horrible on the other side. You have to live in fear and, and constant militarization, which is bad for Israelis. Not to mention the fact that it is unsustainable. We have six million, Palestinian, uh, six million Palestinians, about six and a half million Israelis in a very small country. In the next five to seven years, there will be a Palestinian majority. Palestinians have more children than Israelis do. People somehow try to create, to talk about this as though it was some kind of a threat, as though there's some kind of a problem. Why is it a problem if there are many Palestinians? Why would it be a problem? Why is it a threat? The reality is that you have two people, two societies that are actually very similar. Israeli and Palestinian societies are both highly educated, large middle classes. Of course, Israelis have more resources, so they have, so they're, they're, they're more able to, you know, they're, they're more wealth, they're wealthier. But still, mostly people who are, in the, who are middle class, most people are not fanatic, although there are fanatic groups in both, on both sides. Most Israelis are actually Arabs because most Israelis are the descendants of Jews who emigrated in the 50s from Arab countries. They call them Sephardic Jews. I don't know why. They didn't come from Spain, but I don't think they like to say Arab Jews because Arab is bad and Jew is good. <laughs> so they call them Sephardic or they call them Oriental as though they all came from God knows from China or something. Okay? These are Arab Jews. And to this day, the descendants of Arab Jews will tell you. The ones who came from Morocco will say we're Moroccans. The ones who came from Iraq will say we're Iraqis. The ones who came from Yemen will say we're Yemenites. And they maintain their traditions. And if they don't speak Arabic anymore, it's third generation or so, their parents speak Arabic and their grandparents spoke Arabic. So the two societies are very similar. The two societies need each other. They rely on each other. 
Israel needs doctors. Palestinians are excellent doctors. I always tell this story. My mother had surgery about six months ago at Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. The anesthesiologist and the surgeon were young Palestinian doctors, excellent doctors, took wonderful care of my mother. Israel needs doctors. Palestinians are some of the best doctors in Israel. This I hear from other Israeli doctors. But that same doctor who treated my mother so well, if he has to go to a conference and fly to Tel Aviv airport, he will be stopped over and over again for hours, questioned, humiliated, have every item in his suitcase taken to x-ray. He and his wife, if she's, if she's going with them, will go through humiliating body searches and strip searches for hours, sometimes as long as five, six hours, and they have a plane to catch. And only once they've been checked and sterilized, as they say in Hebrew, then they will be taken by the hand to their seat on the plane. That is, besides being reprehensible, is unsustainable. You have a small country with two communities that are similar and live very close to each other, even though they live with such segregation and such inequality. So the key here is for all of us to get behind the banner of a single democracy, of equal rights. Equal rights that will allow Israelis and Palestinians to, 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 to live and flourish together as equals. Because one, all of you, well, many of you have been there. You've seen it's a beautiful country with endless potential. Endless potential. And again, I would encourage all of you, people always ask, what can we do? Come to more of these. Talk to your friends. Talk to your Jewish friends. There's a whole bunch of books out there. One of them happens to be mine. Feel free to buy them and give them to your friends and talk to them. And don't be afraid to do this. This is the right cause. Standing for justice, standing for peace, standing for equality for Israelis and Palestinians is the right thing to do. And I'll finish with this thought. When our children and grandchildren ask us, where were you on this issue? You will be able to proudly say, we stood with justice. And we stood with the Palestinian cause. The people on the other side, however, will either deny that they supported Israel or will have to be ashamed to admitting that they supported Israel. So keep supporting this cause, and thank you all very much. This year in Jerusalem, Israeli policies limit the number of Palestinians who can live in the city. This year in Jerusalem, Palestinian Jerusalemites are deemed permanent residents. Israel considers them immigrants, even though for many, Jerusalem has been their family home for generations. This year in Jerusalem, the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, is maintained by daily practices of surveillance and control. In recent years, these practices have increasingly relied on technology provided by international corporations. This year in Jerusalem, a Hewlett-Packard powered system divides Palestinians into four categories, each with different rights. Blue Israeli IDs, blue-green Palestinian Jerusalem ideas, green West Bank ideas, and orange Gaza ideas. According to Human Rights Watch, over 640,000 Palestinians risk separation from a direct family member who holds a different color ID. This year in Jerusalem, Hewlett Packard profits from this colored ID system that divides Palestinian families and loved ones. This year in Jerusalem, Israel's center of life policy requires that Palestinian Jerusalemites prove continuous residency in the city to retain their Jerusalem IDs. There's no such requirement for Jewish Israelis. This year in Jerusalem, the decision to grant or deny Jerusalem residency to Palestinians is at the discretion of the Israeli government. Meanwhile, Jews throughout the world are entitled to receive automatic and immediate citizenship through Israel's law of return for Jews and reside in Jerusalem at will. This year in Jerusalem, hundreds of churches, colleges, and socially responsible retirement funds continue to be invested in Hewlett Packard. But this year, let's divest from Hewlett Packard so that next year, Bashana Haba'a, will be one step closer to the day when Palestinian families can gather and pray freely in Jerusalem.
Scarlett Johansson has stayed on as spokesperson for SodaStream even after it was revealed that the product is made on an Israeli settlement. On April 7th, she told a reporter at the New York Daily News that criticism of her was anti-Semitism. Here's a bit of bitter humor from Apartheid Adventures. Great news. Scarlett Johansson is the new international spokeswoman for Israeli apartheid. ScarJo even quit Oxfam so she could spend more time using her objectified body parts to advertise that great Israeli apartheid product, SodaStream. SodaStream's factory is in an Israeli settlement. And Israeli settlements are special colonies in the occupied West Bank where if you're of the correct ethnic religious category, you have special privileges, rights, laws, luxuries that are denied to those other people people right outside your electric fence. Now that's apartheid. Why, you can demolish their homes or even kill them without serious consequences. We're not making this up. And Israel's always taking more land away from those other people in the occupied West Bank and building more settlements to make sure that your ethnic privilege is safe and to make sure those others don't have any economy to speak of and will have to work in Israel's factories. That's SodaStream. No wonder it looks like blood. <laughs> Just kidding, it's orange. Well, don't you worry, ScarJo. Apartheid is sexy. Because if you're of the correct ethnic religious category, Israel's apartheid means you're the man, even if you're a woman. And those others are a captive population you can exploit. So if you care less about human rights and more about ScarJo's objectified body parts, and we think you do, then get yourself some SodaStream and keep the fizz in apartheid. Sorry, Coke and Pepsi. ScarJo's objectified body parts say we're sticking with apartheid. Book your apartheid adventures travel today. Ethnic privilege at affordable prices. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. When the world has gone crazy And it's all becoming clear When they're gunning down our comrades And it seems the end is near As they're loading up the launchers For the tear gas grenades We can take off our bandanas And kiss behind the barricades When it's madness all around And you can see this at a glance We will sing and we will cry